The U.S. Navy's Robert E. Peary is the ultimate seagoing superstore. Her mission? Resupplying pirate-busting warships in the Gulf of Aden. It's a high-risk job with no room for error. When ships are 150 feet apart, it's a dangerous situation. Her specialty? The delivery of everything, from fuel and medical supplies to fresh produce and dessert. Captain yeah, Seppo, your uh, ice cream just came aboard, sir. Uh, ice cream. Peary sails into harm's way to keep the Navy fed and fueled. USNS Robert E. Peary is one of the U.S. Navy's newest and most advanced combat replenishment ships. She's pulling into the secure African port of Djibouti to load up for a dangerous resupply and refueling mission in pirate-infested waters. Djibouti is located on the Horn of Africa. It's where the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden meet, and where marauding Somali pirates are constantly attacking and hijacking commercial shipping. Several countries, including the United States, have sent warships to stop the pirates. Their mission is so crucial, these warships often can't return to port for months, which is where the Peary comes in. She brings critically needed supplies to them. Captain Greg Horner is Peary's civilian master and the man in overall command of the ship. How many trucks uh, are left down there up here now? Our mission is to maintain the coalition ships so that they can stay on station and uh, not uh, have to come off station and uh, allow pirate activity to, uh, to flourish uh, while they're gone. Peary is an armed, floating grocery store and gas station. She's the final link in the Navy's supply chain and an essential member of the anti-pirate task force. She delivers massive amounts of pre-ordered food, fuel, essential cargo, and spare parts to Navy warships on the sharp end of anti-pirate patrol. Peary is a Navy ship, but with a difference. She's operated by a civilian crew of 129 and 12 U.S. Navy personnel who perform security and logistics duties. Navy Commander Jerry Rea is in charge of the ship's military personnel and responsible for everything that gets loaded aboard. Yeah, how many more pallets of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables do we have coming? He has less than 24 hours to get 325 tons of supplies off the trucks, onto the pier, and into the ship. The intense desert heat isn't helping. Right now, uh, the temperature is probably a little over 100 degrees with 90% humidity, so the shelf life of this deteriorates very quickly the longer it sits out here on the pier. Before being loaded aboard Peary, the pre-ordered cargo is tagged with special stickers, each color representing a specific ship. You'll see that there's a, different, a lot of different types of commodities here. We've got some of the hardier fruits and vegetables. The onions will last a lot longer. Some of the softer fruits, like uh, peaches and uh, romaine lettuce, it's very, very delicate. So it's, it's imperative that we do get it on board uh, pretty quickly. Delivered in 2008, Peary is huge, 210 meters long and 32 meters wide. If stood on one end, she would be as tall as a 70-story skyscraper. Peary has 14 dry cargo holds, including three refrigeration and freezer holds. Fully loaded, her total cargo space is equal to 300 semi-trailers. In the stern, the ship's helicopter hangar and flight deck. And below that, the heart of Peary, the engine room and electric generating station. Once craned aboard, Peary's fleet of 25 forklifts move the cargo to its appropriate onboard locations. A blue sticker means a trip to the freezers. With 20 years on the job, junior supply officer James Brown makes sure everything is put in the right place so that ships always get their critically needed supplies, not someone else's. We don't want to get anything mixed up, so that way when it's time for our unreps, everything goes pretty smooth. We don't have to look for pallets. Everything is already organized. 
Danger is an occupational hazard for Peary's crew. Paying attention and making sure nobody gets hurt during the load-in is part of the job. At any time, those cables in there, anything can happen. So you have to stand back and be aware of your surroundings. You can't be around here lollygagging and looking at what's going on elsewhere. You got to be having it, what's going on on this stage right now. One of the unique design features on Peary is the climate-controlled main cargo deck. Two football fields long is a floating freeway for moving cargo to and from the staging areas. You can see in the truck tunnels here, we have plenty of room. We can actually run two fork trucks simultaneously side by side up and down the passageways. We have a passageway on the port side and a passageway on the starboard side that starts off from the very front of the ship and goes all the way to the back. These pallets of frozen food are placed in high-strength nets, ready to be airlifted by Peary's helicopters to her warship customers. They're loading the uh, cargo into the nets to be wrapped up, brought down into the cargo hold through the uh, elevator into the freeze hold. They'll just bring it straight up, directly onto the flight deck, hook up the poles, and fly it off to our customer. Back on the pier, Trucks and camels jostle for space. The trucks are loaded with more cargo for Peary. The crew is working against the clock and the stifling heat to get the load-in completed. Veterinary technician and food inspector Staff Sergeant Brian Davis is the only U.S. Army member serving on Peary. He's known by fellow crew members as the Army of One. My job is to make sure that all food is going to our ship itself and all the other ships within our air responsibility meets uh, our contractual compliance, wholesomeness, and uh, free security. Uh, make sure it's free from any like bugs, roaches, you know, cockroaches, rats. Making sure there's not, you know, they ain't coming laced with anthrax, bombs, ricin, or anything like that. With the load-in going full swing, navigation officer James Gardner briefs the captain and his fellow officers on the mission ahead. And uh, as you guys know, we'll be swinging off the pier, and we'll be heading northerly in a northerly direction for outside the uh, shoaling areas. General weather is what you see, hot and dusty, and, uh, and that's all I have. Peary's seven-day mission is to resupply over half a dozen warships patrolling the Gulf of Aden's east-west shipping lanes. It's a huge area, almost as big as Texas, and it's the prime hunting ground of Somali pirates. Some of the ships are down to their final reserves of food and fuel. Peary is desperately needed. The load-in is finally complete, and the massive ship gets underway. The bottom of Peary's hull extends 10 meters below the waterline, the height of a three-story building. We got one. Slow ahead. Slow ahead. Slow ahead. Using his local knowledge, the harbor pilot guides Peary through the port's shallow shoals. Safely clear of the harbor and on the rising high tide, she's leaving the port of Djibouti behind. Peary is now on her own on mission and heading towards unknown dangers in the Gulf of Aden's Pirate Alley. <laughs> Navy supply ship Robert E. Peary is now on day two of her mission in the dangerous pirate-infested Gulf of Aden. In just a few hours, she'll be hooking up with her first warship customer to deliver fresh food, supplies, and fuel. With Yemen to the north and Somalia to the south, she's in the middle of the busiest east-west shipping lanes in the world. Over 20,000 ships pass through here every year, coming from or heading to the Suez Canal. And all of them are hoping to avoid being taken hostage by pirates. What you see down here are the commercial traffic transiting the transit lanes uh, south of us. Piracy primarily takes place in this area. The coalition ships transit and patrol this area to look for any uh, possible pirate uh, operations. Even Peary has to be on high alert for pirate attack. But unlike commercial ships, she has the ability to defend herself. 
In 2009, a sister resupply ship was shot at by pirates in these very waters. We, we carry a uh, Navy security debt on board to take care of any, uh, any problems that, we, that might arise with piracy. Master at Arms Second Class Petty Officer Simone Campbell is a security specialist with training in ship defense. She's more than ready to deal with any pirates that want to mess with Peary. On the robbery pair, we have a different assortment of weapons, one being the heavy barrel machine gun that's right here. It's capable of doing a lot of areas of fire for it. We've had different instances where we have different boats come alongside and are in the area or interested in the actions of the ship, but for the most part, our security on board is the vital asset that keeps them away most of the time from the ship. Okay, we'll go ahead and go left, right, uh, left and right. On the uh, bridge, five. navigation five. officer James Gardner hears a radio distress five. call from a nearby ship under pirate attack. Longitude 044 degrees, five, seven, decimal one eight. He calls Captain Horner. Captain, on uh, channel 16, we heard uh, pirate chatter. Did, uh, did we know how far away they were? Peary is not a warship, but she could rescue survivors in a crisis at sea. It was a frantic call um, saying that they were being boarded on the bow. Just uh, keep monitoring the VHF for any other uh, possible traffic. Right. If push comes to shove, Horner will divert course to the rescue. But right now, he chooses to wait. We uh, had uh, pirate chatter over Channel 16, and uh, normally coalition warships are in the area and respond to them, but there may be action going on that we're unaware of, and we'll get some information on it at some other time. In the meantime, it's business as usual. Coalition warships are on their way, but it may already be too late. The Gulf of Aden covers over half a million square kilometers, and the warships can't be everywhere at once. While Peary's security team broils in the sun, deep down in the refrigerated holds, yeoman storekeeper Justin Figuration is dressed more like a snowmobiler in February. Well, it's, it's negative 10 degrees down here. It's about 100 degrees upstairs. We want to try to keep it as cold as it, as it is down here. The items, I want to keep them nice and fresh from here to up there. When they call down here for a freeze, we put it on the elevator with the fork truck, send it up, and they take it from there. On the flight deck, Chief Boson Craig Arnold and his crew prepare the netted cargo to be airlifted to their first warship. Bring it in, set it down. It ranges from soda to paper to potato chips to bread, all the provisions that they need to do their mission uh, while they're out here. Peary's two helicopters have a maximum safe working load, so each pallet needs to be weighed and sorted. 250 pounds. 250. Bring it down. Straight in. And the idea behind this is these are uh, safe working loads, 4,000 pounds apiece. Careful calculation makes sure the helicopters aren't overloaded. A single mistake could prove fatal. All right, so I keep everything approximately around 3,500 to 3,800. I give myself an extra 400 pound buffer. Peary's getting ready to meet her first customer, the guided missile cruiser USS San Jacinto. Twice in 2010, this warship fought and defeated armed pirates, capturing them and saving lives. On the USS San Jacinto. Good morning, Captain Coral, officers and crew. The San Jacinto approaches carefully for a pinpoint accurate supply drop from the Peary. It's what's called a vert rep or vertical replenishment. Peary's helicopters will airlift supplies to the pirate busting warship. As long as the two ships are alongside, you're always in the danger of accidents happening. So you want to get everybody away as soon as possible. That's why we do the simultaneous uh, refueling and uh, vert rep. San Jacinto slides into position beside the Peary. The two ships are dangerously close, just 60 meters apart on a parallel course. Flight quarters, flight quarters. Now man your flight quarters station. On the flight deck, one of the ship's two Puma helicopters is ready to carry netted cargo over to the San Jacinto. For pilot Kevin Black, the confined flight decks on the smaller ships are a real worry. He needs to use all of his flying skills to avoid dropping the load in the wrong spot and injuring any of the deck crew. 
the wind patterns are different around those decks and the, the amount of uh, space we have to work uh, with the load is pretty limited. So we have to really kind of thread our loads in to uh, get them to fit as many as possible before the uh, personnel on that ship clear it off. Flying loads between ships is a really dangerous job. If something goes wrong, it's usually catastrophic. We operate very low, and if we ever lost an engine, we would be probably in the water almost immediately. So it's a significant risk working with an external load. Peary maintains a steady course and a constant speed of 13 knots or 24 kilometers per hour. It's up to the customer ship to stay right beside Peary. A bow line between the two ships is a critical visual aid. And uh, they're looking at the flags to, to maintain their position alongside us. We maintain a course and speed, and we don't change anything. Any deviation could cause a very dangerous collision in seconds. They're controlling their vessel alongside us by uh, adjusting their uh, speed and their course to maintain the uh, flags uh, in, the, in the position that they're in right now. With just half a football field separating the San Jacinto and Piri, the two ships are just one computer glitch away from disaster. That's because Piri's steering is computer controlled. There's no mechanical connection between the bridge and the rudder. Deep in the ship's stern, an emergency backup steering system is crewed by third officer Billy Jean Gooch. To avoid a collision, it would take at least 100 turns of the wheel for just a small five degree change in direction. The emergency steering room is only crewed during replenishments and when entering or leaving port, times when there is a zero margin of error. Okay, Puma 03 is taking uh, last two loads over to the customer ship. One of Commander Rea's many responsibilities includes manning the control tower and coordinating the airlifts. It's pretty amazing to be able to put a helicopter in a, uh, in a harbor like that uh, with winds and all the different dynamics going on to be able to hook up a, a heavy load and fly it over to the other ship. Um, that takes a, takes a lot of coordination, a lot of talent. Fuel is pumped and fresh fruits and vegetables, supplies and mail are airlifted to the San Jacinto. So we have our own Below decks in the infirmary, Peary's medical officer, Nicole Chonder, packs up a potentially life-saving shipment for the emergency surgical team aboard the San Jacinto. And we had a request from uh, the expeditionary medical clinic to transport some blood over to a ship that's out at sea that can't make it into port because of their mission. So hopefully it'll not necessarily be needed, but it's there in case it is. It is a very special delivery. The last flight of the replenishment serves as a reminder that there is a war being waged out here in Pirate Alley. After 90 minutes, the supply mission is complete. No, oh, Roger, as soon as we see you breaking away, we'll come around to starboard uh, to a course of uh, 250. With fresh supplies and tanks full of fuel, the San Jacinto slowly pulls away and gets back to work, protecting commercial shipping from pirate attack. USNS Robert E. Peary is 80 kilometers away from her next customer ship in the Gulf of Aden. On the bridge, Captain Horner has news for Commander Rea about this morning's pirate attack, and it's not good. Oh, okay. The uh, motor vessel hijacked uh, in uh, the Gulf of Aden. The vessels are advised to exercise extreme caution. Pirate ships and, are uh, on the prowl and there. nearby. Uh, so uh, what we heard this morning was, in fact, a, uh, an actual uh, wow. hijacking. Wow. Not, probably not that far away from us either. No, not too far. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty serious. But, uh, the two men know that without their supplies, the battle against piracy could be lost. All right. Thanks, sir. Mm -hmm. Captain Horner puts Peary on high alert 
as she prepares for her next mission with the pirate hunters. In her fuel holds, Peary carries both marine diesel and aviation fuel for her warship customers. It's all stored in huge onboard fuel cargo tanks. A total of 3,100 cubic meters, roughly the volume of one and a half Olympic-sized swimming pools. But even Peary needs to top up her cargo fuel tanks whenever she can, either in port or at sea. Because we only have just so much fuel to give, we have to go and get it ourselves. We either get it in port or we'll get it from uh, one of the tankers that's already out here. Today, she's calling on another member of the fleet's resupply team, USNS Laramie, a ship whose sole purpose is to refuel naval vessels. And I receive our shot lines for enemy ships on signal. With the two ships side by side, messenger lines are shot across and larger ropes are pulled back to Peary. Everything we do is, is dangerous. Uh, there's no other way to, to put it. Uh, when ships are 150 feet apart, uh, it's, it's a dangerous situation. Uh, a lot of things can happen. Steel span wire cables are then hooked up for both the refueling and the cargo transfer. The constant danger of at-sea replenishment keeps everyone on edge. A lot of people can be hurt down on the stations, things of that nature, so you're constantly thinking about uh, the safety aspect of uh, what we're doing. Being clear. Come up on the head. The steel cables are tensioned between the ships. Laramie's fuel probe is winched across to the Peary, and the refueling process begins. The Laramie pumps almost 2 million liters of marine diesel and 380,000 liters of jet fuel across to the Robert E. Peary. It's the equivalent of over 70 tanker trucks of fuel. At a rate of 13,000 liters per minute, the refueling will take just under two hours. The uh, refueling at sea is actually faster, and uh, we can also uh, get going as soon as we get the fuel. Bosun mate Paul Marshall is the man in charge. Bridge station five, we have ship-to-ship -ship communication. We are also hooked up and connected. Permission for them to tension the high line on signal. Okay, five, go ahead, tension up the high line on signal. While Peary's fuel tanks are being topped up, 80 pallets of food and supplies are being sent across to Laramie in a process called a CONREP, or Connected Replenishment. The gentleman right here with the signal paddles, he's our signalman, tells them when to heave around, when to slack off on the load, so it can, the trolley can travel back and forth in between the two ships. The system works like an industrial strength zip line. The King Towers lift the pallets off the deck to a point that's above the receiving ship's deck. Then, gravity takes over. Weighing thousands of kilograms and moving at three and a half meters per second, these loads can be lethal if they crash into the receiving ship. Deck crews have to stay very focused. As soon as the pallets have been cleared on Laramie, the cargo hook is sent back for the next load. Perry's job is tough, dangerous, and doesn't earn the crew any medals. But they know that without them, the war on the pirates would be lost. Anytime you hear about a motor vessel or any ship being hijacked by pirates, it makes it more important to make sure that the stuff that we are delivering is, is top notch, uh, because these guys don't have the, lu the luxury of being able to pull in port to get fresh goods. I'm gonna let him go. <laughs> For Commander Rea and his Navy colleagues, the weekly pizza night is a time to wind down. It's nice. It's nice we can uh, chat about things other than just work. It's real good to have these. Most of Peary's civilian and military crew members are away for months at a time, making the harsh working conditions even more difficult. Uh, I live in, uh, in Virginia with my wife and a three-year-old daughter. You never get used to being away from the family for extended periods of time. It never gets easier. Uh, a lot of times it's it's difficult to to balance your mission here with you know maybe some cares or concerns that you have at home if you have different things going on. So my kids are a little bit older, they understand a little bit more, and uh, 
a little bit of a struggle, uh, one I wasn't quite uh, expecting. Aboard a typical U.S. Navy ship, crew accommodation is shared, cramped, and spartan. But aboard the Robert E. Peary, crew quarters have more in common with a commercial cargo ship. Welcome to my living quarters. For months at a time, Junior Supply Officer James Brown gets to call this stateroom home. This is what I call home away from home. I normally sit here when I get off, unwind for a little while, watch a little television. And of course, at the end of the night, I lay down here and get my rest, get ready for the next day. And I also have my own bathroom here, fortunately. So I, I don't have to share with anybody. I come here after a long, hot day, take a shower, and then, of course, go back in my room, unwind and relax. After two hours and with the sun starting to set in the Gulf of Aden, the transfer with USNS Laramie is almost complete. Now I'll mark sunset. Secure all dead lights and curtains to aid in the safe navigation of the vessel. And good night, Mr. Perry. With a full load of cargo fuel, the Robert E. Perry is on to her next mission and the most dangerous transfer yet. It's 6 a.m. in the Gulf of Aden, and it's already 42 degrees Celsius. USNS Robert E. Perry is just hours away from her next warship customer. Commander Rhea and the rest of the Navy team keep in shape on the ship's main cargo deck. When you're doing this three days a week, as hard as we do it, you feel it. It keeps us in top shape, though. Then you got the heat and the humidity down here. You got to definitely get a good workout. Strong PT session kicks off the day. Everybody's pumped up, and uh, everybody starts out stress-free. Then it's back to work. Peary's Gulf of Aden resupply mission is now in its fourth day. And the guided missile destroyer USS Farragut is lining up for what's called a connected at sea replenishment. This is the most dangerous of all their operations and where a collision is most likely to happen. USS Farragut has commenced your approach to starboard. Okay, welcome them alongside. On the USS Farragut, good afternoon, Captain Daly, officers and crew. And welcome alongside the USS Robert E. Perry. Stand by to receive our shot lines. Forward, midships and aft. On signal. Stand by to receive shot lines. USS Robert E. Perry. The span wires for cargo and refueling are rigged up between the two ships. Stand by to receive span wire. Station 8. Farragut Captain, Navy Commander Bill Daly's ship hasn't been to shore in two months and is down to its final stores of fuel and food. Peary is a welcome sight. We're going to the gas station at sea. Uh, we're taking on two types of gas. One is uh, gas the ship runs off of and another one is gas that we use for our two helicopters. Farragut Supply Officer Lieutenant Mike Augustine is watching his men carefully. With the ships less than 60 meters apart and steel cables under tremendous pressure, they're back in the danger zone. We've got two huge lines, steel cables that are actually tensioned between two ships. And if any of these cables snap or anything happens, we drop the load, everyone's in danger. That's why you see everybody with hard hats, we've got life vests on, we want to do everything we can to mitigate that danger. Right now we're taking uh, between 40 and 50 pallets, uh, which is for us a pretty big hit. With a front row view of the replenishment, Commander Rhea has saved the best shipment for last. We're going to send a pallet over that's going to be wrapped in a black shroud. That's going to be very special. It's going to be guaranteed to be a morale booster for the crew. Back on the Farragut, they keep a close eye on the big black shipment. The uh, black mat on the uh, surrounding it is actually extra thermal uh, protection from the sun, which there isn't much out right now. But uh, normally out here in the uh, Middle East, it's really hot, and all the stuff sits on deck. We don't want it to melt, so that helps it uh, keeps it uh, insulated. Captain Suppo, your uh, ice cream just came aboard, sir. Uh, ice cream arriving. <laughs> yes, sir. The gear from the Department Captain. Ice cream restored. We get a 
lot of trouble by the big world if we uh, don't get our weapons and stuff aboard, but we do a good job with that. And all of a sudden, if ice cream doesn't come aboard, then it's like a mutiny on board. With a suffocating humidity and a temperature hovering around 46 degrees Celsius, on Peary's deck, the unrelenting heat is more than a discomfort. It can kill. Today, the sun's blasting down on us pretty hot. So it's uh, important to make sure that all the crew gets hydrated real well. With this, uh, with this heat, people sweat out uh, a lot of salt fast, and uh, you can have people going down with heat stress. Captain Horner doesn't want any of his crew to collapse from heat stroke. He makes sure that medical officer Nicole Shonder keeps them hydrated. Some places, depending on where we've been, the radiant temperature as to what black has absorbed is basically about 125, 126 degrees. Using a dehydration chart, Shonder ensures the men are getting half a liter of water every hour, any less, and she'd be seeing them in the infirmary. The heat is not the only invisible enemy. Another one churns in the water between the two ships. When they are in parallel moving forward, you get wake uh, going off both of the bows, and the wake is hitting each other. What happens is that positive pressure up forward causes the bows, uh, the bows to push apart, and the sterns actually go to, the aft ends of both ships actually go together, and you run the risk of a collision. With less than 60 meters of separation, the two hulls create a funnel forcing water to accelerate between them and creating an area of instability. This is called the Venturi effect, and it's forcing the bows apart and the sterns together. Uh, so you've got the laws of physics work working completely against you uh, in this operation. That's really one of the major things that makes it the most dangerous uh, peacetime operation that we do in the Navy. Farragut's Captain Daly knows a collision could cost lives. Everyone needs to be hypervigilant. As we're driving the ship, we are literally driving half degrees of course changes in order to stay alongside, as well as single RPM changes of the ship's RPM, the shafts, in order to maintain perfect stationing alongside this ship. To make sure that we don't have a, uh, you know, a uh, collision here at sea. The Farragut's fuel tanks are full, and the hoses are pulled back to Peary. But the tension span wires are still attached. In this moment of danger, Captain Daly springs a high-pressure drill on his crew. It's called an emergency breakaway. They have one minute to sever their link with the Peary. executing the emergency there as well. We are also now accelerating how we break away all of our stations, both on the, on the uh, Robert E. Perry and on board Farragut here. Time is critical and teamwork is key. The longer it takes, the more dangerous it is as the gap between the two ships grows. We're watching our, our uh, distance lines between the two ships while this is occurring. Make sure we're, you know, everybody's um, adrenaline starts going. The crews on both ships have seconds to disengage the connected span wire so that Farragut can break away. He's getting ready now to position this for detensioning. And there he goes. He just detensioned the line. So now we're getting ready to trip it over here and start to drive away. Farragut's four massive gas turbine engines put out maximum power, and she slices through the sea at over 30 knots, leaving the Peary in her wake. And Peary's onto her next and biggest mission yet. It's day six of the resupply mission, and another blistering day in the Gulf of Aden. USNS Peary and her crew have been assigned an important but solemn task. During the night, one of the civilian mariners aboard the fleet replenishment oiler USNS Laramie died of a heart attack. One of Peary's helicopters will pick up the body and carry it to the US Navy base in Djibouti. For the crew, it's a sad day and a chance to say goodbye to a fellow mariner as he begins his final journey home to the United States.
there's little time for reflection. Up next, her biggest client yet, the nuclear-powered aircraft carrier USS Eisenhower. Now we are in on your flight quarter stations. Flight quarters, flight quarters. She's on her way home from a six-month deployment in the Arabian Sea, where her aircraft flew daily combat missions into Afghanistan. On the flight deck, clear the flight deck of all unauthorized personnel. All personnel, helmets on, strapped, and goggles down, and no loose gear about your person. The giant carrier is getting ready to form up on Piri for an aerial replenishment. Okay, guys, let's move it out. Let's go. We're checking to make sure there's no fought out here, which is foreign object debris. We want to make sure that uh, nothing goes up in the rotors, goes into the engines when they uh, turn up. USS Eisenhower is now a safe 500 meters away and holding position. The two ships won't be connected. It's a helicopter-only operation. And this time, Peary's got help. One of the carrier's Seahawks is also getting a slice of the action. Eisenhower may be one of the world's most powerful warships, but ships like Robert E. Peary keep her in business. We could not do our mission without logistics. And ships like the Robert E. Perry provide an invaluable service uh, to us here uh, on the carrier. Eisenhower Captain D. Mooborn has a crew that needs feeding and aircraft that needs spare parts. They also need packing supplies. When they get back to port, the aircraft will fly off the carrier, but everything else needs to be boxed up. Today, um, a lot of the supplies that we're getting will support our homecoming. Uh, we had, uh, you know, we, we, we don't need them until it's time to go home, but then when we do, we need a lot of boxes to put things in. So right now we're bringing on the boxes and, and pallets that will, um, you know, facilitate that offload. Uh, flight deck tower, uh, let's go ahead and break out the freeze and chill, get it out on station. From Fury's control tower, Commander Rhea keeps tabs on what's being sent over to Eisenhower and what's being brought back. Aircraft carriers are some of the largest floating real estate in the world, but there's not much closet space. Large items like broken aircraft engines are being sent back to Peary. We pull the port, we get them inducted back into the system, so we get them back to the States, to get back in the repair shop so that you've got a ready service engine ready to come back out in the theater um, to fight the war. Captains are paid to worry, and with multiple helicopters slinging loads from ship to ship, there's always the chance that something can go wrong. You know, our margins are already measured in inches and seconds. It's just the nature of our business. So if we have a malfunction that, that, already, that closes those margins, then that's what I worry about. Now, that could be a malfunction on the ship. It could be a malfunction in the, in the helicopter in the air with one of the lines or with personnel casualty. So it's a constant worry. In Peary's control tower, Mike Hodge has many of the same worries. He's a civilian pilot with over 20,000 hours of flight time and the man in charge of Peary's air detachment. I've been in the helicopter business for, I'm going into my 40th year now, and in that 40 year time span, I have lost 39 uh, good friends. And it's, it just shows that it only takes one small mistake one time. So you have to stay very sharp, you have to stay focused all the time. And today, the crew comes dangerously close to a small mistake that could cost lives. Loose packing boxes are in danger of being sucked into the helicopter's engines and rotors. Cardboard is light, and with the banding on there, we started seeing some of the cardboard coming apart um, from the uh, rotor wash. So it got a little tricky. Five-dollar cardboard boxes that could take down a multi-million dollar helicopter. Flight deck uh, responded quickly by making sure everything was strapped down properly. Make sure we don't have any piece of cardboard um, fodding the aircraft or uh, foreign, o foreign object debris, it's called, to uh, hit either the rotor blades or get sucked into an engine. Back on the carrier, the deck crew moves quickly to get the pallets off the flight deck onto the huge aircraft elevator and safely into the hangar deck. 
Eisenhower's supply officer, Commander Rob Dare, keeps things moving. About 40 to 50,000 pounds a week is what we get from these guys. It's a combination of supplies, fresh fruit and vegetables, some ship storm material. So usually what we do is come out, make sure we got what we want, and then bring the forklifts out to take it off. Now secure from flight quarters, secure from flight quarters. Piri's Puma is back on the flight deck and USS Eisenhower is on the move. In another four weeks, she'll be back in her home port of Norfolk, Virginia. But Piri's crew is not going home. Another mission awaits. USNS Robert E. Peary has completed another successful seven-day mission in the Gulf of Aden's Pirate Alley. She's resupplied nine satisfied warship customers and their 9,000 sailors. In total, Peary delivered the equivalent of 20 semi-trailer loads of cargo and 80 tanker loads of fuel. Okay, welcome them alongside. Good afternoon, USS Gonzalez. But while other ships head home after their deadly duty at sea, Peary will stay on a relentless cycle, returning to port to pick up more supplies, and then it's right back out to sea. Turnaround is 24 hours. There's no r and &R, and she won't go home for almost nine months. You always think, oh, it's a piece of cake, we've done this before. Each time it gets a little bit more difficult. It doesn't get any easier. On the bridge, Captain has the song. Like the rest of the crew, Captain Horner is used to the rhythm of seven days out and one day in. It's kind of like a round robin. We go into Djibouti, load, come out, run through our customers, turn around, go back into Djibouti, reload, come back out. Out on the flight deck, one of the Pumas is getting some well-deserved attention. A fresh water bath to remove corrosive sea salt. And the tail rotor drive shaft needs to be pulled out for essential maintenance. Pulling this shaft out so we can rotate the rest of it with the blades folded. So once the shaft is out, we'll move the aircraft inside and then we can do the rest of the shafts at our leisure. As Piri gets closer to Djibouti, hot desert winds deliver an added level of discomfort. Uh, it looks like a haze, but it's uh, actually dust in the air from uh, blowing off of the uh, Somali and Djibouti uh, coast there. You can actually uh, feel it in your teeth. It's really difficult for uh, visibility when you have traffic in the area, when you can't see them more than three miles away. So it can be extremely dangerous. As Peary approaches her pier, trucks, cranes, and forklifts are ready for action. There's no time to lose. Cargo ships and planes have brought in fresh food, supplies, spare parts, and mail from the United States. And Commander Rea is standing by to get them loaded on board for their next mission. Well, right now you're seeing stage all the dry cargo. We're probably going to have about 15 uh, freeze and chill trucks show up on the pier. Okay, Roger that. How's the uh, how's the stuff looking? Is it looking fresh? All right, this one. Hey, this one's good to go. Send it up. And we'll be back out for uh, another fun week, uh, taking care of customers who are out there um, battling pirates. Broken aircraft engines, recyclable waste and mail for home is offloaded. While pallets loaded with fresh produce, frozen food and military supplies are craned aboard. We're almost finished now. We're loading the dry cargo for the fleet. This is fleet freight. We have uh, about two or three different color codes that we're getting ready to stage here on the main deck. Make sure everybody stays hydrated and uh, cool as much as possible. Okay, good. Down in the holds, more crew are organizing cargo for the next group of warship customers. It's just another fast 24-hour load-in and turnaround for the lifeblood of the Navy. Us being able to bring the supplies that the Navy needs to stay on station 
to, to fight the pirates is uh, very uh, fulfilling. Like our work, and uh, it's it's nice to be able to support the uh, the Navy in the uh, the anti-piracy uh, effort. USNS Robert E. Peary, one of the most advanced class of Navy resupply ships in the world, and a critical member of the fleet battling pirates on the high seas.